Watch this. The U of I could be joining forces with the U of P in more than just a jumble of letters. Several lawmakers are questioning how the University of Idaho came to the conclusion they would buy the University of Phoenix, a half a billion dollar deal very few saw coming. From universities to, well, a different kind of education. We're talking SWAT school, and a lot of Idaho police officers are there this week learning certain skills for certain situations. Happy Juneteenth to all who celebrate and those who just observe. After all, it is a federal holiday and a state of Idaho holiday, just not necessarily a statewide one. Idaho's first public university wants to go private, well, at least partly. When the state's premier land-grant university announced about a month ago it wanted to join up with the University of Phoenix, a private for-profit college, it took a lot of people by surprise, including some Idaho lawmakers whose job is controlling the purse strings of the Moscow-based school. Well, several, several of those legislators, members of the State Board of Education and leaders from the U of I got together last week to talk about it with the goal of getting closer to an affiliation agreement with the U of P, the mostly online school whose ads you've likely seen while watching your favorite sporting event. Vandal leadership says they see this as securing their school's future since most students these days lean toward less traditional educational opportunities. The purchase price, $550 million, but the two schools would not just become one school. It'd be two separate schools affiliated with unique identities. So the surprise factor of this potential purchase had several lawmakers wondering about non-disclosure agreements, how this deal got to this point with very few people knowing about it, you know, transparency stuff. Here's Joe Paris. The target is on the table for the University of Idaho. They hope to make a deal to affiliate with the University of Phoenix to improve access to education around Idaho. University of Idaho says the purchase would be financed through non-taxable and taxable bonds through a new nonprofit organization they would set up to manage assets of the University of Phoenix. Idaho lawmakers have major questions about the deal. We see that this transaction has potential, but we also see that it has risk. And as elected representatives, we on this committee specifically have the duty of fiscal oversight of the taxpayers' money. Representative Wendy Horman is one of the leaders on Idaho's budgeting committee. They met to ask questions to University of Idaho and state board leaders. We want to trust, uh, but we must verify. And if we can't verify, we can't trust. So we want to ensure that this deal is constitutional, legal, financially sound, and that Idaho taxpayers will not pay the price if, if the deal does go awry. If the deal does go awry and loses money, University of Idaho President Scott Green says U of I is agreeing to guarantee up to $10 million annually to cover payments if the nonprofit they set up to manage the project cannot cover funds. But U of I advocates for the deal say that they aren't concerned because of the University of Phoenix's documented ability to generate substantial cash flow. A hang-up for lawmakers centers on non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs, that University of Idaho and state board leaders sign that prevents them from sharing details of the deal and projections of operation. I fully recognize the way this transaction was conducted was not ideal and, and probably was not my preference. But as those of you who work in business know, sometimes we have to play the cards that were dealt and make compromises to reach agreements to get done. Uh, this, uh, uh, this transaction came to us very recently. We quickly identified the transaction and we put together a review team of the best and brightest experts out there. Lawmakers expressed that they understood the principle of the NDAs, but still question how they and the public are supposed to understand the deal and risks with it without access to more information. President Green explained that the NDAs also benefit Idaho as the buyer. On the buyer side, what it enables us to do is go in and take a look at the books and records uh, at a detailed level, ask detailed questions, assess for ourselves the risk involved and get our experts, uh, which we have world-class experts here, the best in the business, um, to take a look at that and determine, okay, what are the risks? Lawmakers asked questions about the deal and risks surrounding it for about two hours. U of I and state board leaders essentially explained that public money was only at risk in a worst-case scenario, something leaders concede is highly unlikely but still a risk. 
Some lawmakers are hoping and asking if the NDAs can be dropped ahead of the deal closure. Uh, this transaction is not done until it's closed. Um, and in the meantime, that competitive information could get out into the marketplace and to their competitors. So I'm just saying, I, I just don't see them doing that. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but it, it's kind of, you know, where it is. And that's kind of the way business is done. Idaho lawmakers also questioned if executive session meetings at the state board level violated any possible laws, implying that it could have been an oversight of very strict rules on making business deals behind closed doors away from the public. State board and U of I leaders explained their process and assured lawmakers that they are aware of the rules and followed them. But, Ryan, lawmakers will continue to you know, research the topic and ask a lot of questions. Meanwhile, if all of this does go through, the accrediting boards for the University of Idaho and the University of Phoenix, they need to approve this and make sure that you know, everything is right. on the up and up. That wouldn't happen towards the very end of the year, so November, so a long way to go. But there's a lot of important questions, but it was a pretty unique uh, business deal here. I assume when President Green said this came upon us rather quickly, this had to do with the, or our state of Arkansas saying no to a similar type deal with the University of Phoenix. Is that correct? Yeah, and the University of Phoenix had kind of been working with the state of Arkansas and the University of Arkansas for several years. And um, you could ask the people in Arkansas what happened there. But long story short, the deal didn't go through. Right. So all of a sudden, the University of Idaho is on the table as an option. And it looks like it's, it's got a strong chance of happening. But we'll see. All right, they're going to look into it a little bit further. All right, yeah. thank you very much, Joe. All right, what about swatting? Well, if you're not familiar with that term, well, just ask your kids. If you are familiar with that term, well, this story is really not about that. It is, though, about SWAT teams and how they're trained in the state of Idaho. Any local police department with a SWAT team sends those members to Caldwell to be taught with the most up-to-date special weapons and tactics, SWAT, SWAT. This training, it's the only one in the state. For 15 years and counting, Caldwell Police have trained and hosted officers from all around Idaho on how to clear rooms, breach doors, manage a hostage situation. The goal, working toward a peaceful resolution in what could end up being a hostile one. Here's Andrew Bartline. We're going to walk through this. All right, tap up. Just keep working that. There's something to be said for being first. You can't be the first one in all the time because you get burned out. It's another thing to be the only. We're a little crowded right here, but that's fine. Crowded because this is the only SWAT school in the state. Correct. Corporal Jesse Cooper yep. helps with the training. SWAT school. I love it. This is the best week of the year for us. So as part of those standards, a SWAT team must attend a 40-hour training every year. You stay out. Training you're, you're, for a very specific hallway. type of situation. We go through what's called safety priorities. Check your door. Locked. Safety priorities are hostages, innocents, police, and suspects. When you have hostages, we don't have time to react. You have to start making decisions in order to save someone's life because someone's life is in jeopardy. It's come in handy with some very, very bad situations we've had here in Coldwell that basically don't make the news because we handle it so fast. Bob Heaton is a training officer. Oh, I love it. I'm proud of it. And other departments and agencies are latching on, making the priority-based training a priority of their own. This year we have uh, Rupert Police, Payette County Sheriff's Office, Payette City Police, Boise PD, um, numerous of our, our own uh, new SWAT operators that are assigned to the team now. So having everybody here, learning what you know, what everyone else does and, and just building on it and getting better every day. Yeah, two and three ago. With one single top priority. Hopefully end something peacefully. Remember, you don't go in any place by yourself, always with, with the pairs. The militarization of police is, is a language you'll hear sometimes. Are you guys conscious of that as you work through this training and the tactics of, as you say, trying to end something peacefully? Uh, of course. We have the very first class that all of our students attend is a almost three hour legal brief on when SWAT can be activated, what type of tactics we can use, and how the courts and you know society in itself uh, judge what we do you know, as, as part of that tactical team. Officer Heaton says there aren't full-time SWAT teams in Idaho, to be clear, are not full-time SWAT teams in Idaho. The officers at this training could work on what we would consider to be a normal role as an officer, think about a patrol officer. So the question then became, why does a patrol officer need to be certified for a SWAT team? They say multiple, off or multiple officers told me they could be the first one on scene at a situation that would require these skills. So at a minimum, Brian, the idea is... Uh, you show up to a situation like this, you at least know the skills and tactics and equipment, if necessary, to hold down a situation mm -hmm. until other people arrive, and hopefully they can find a conclusion there. But, uh, yeah, a lot of these people 
just regular police officers at your regular department in town. I know nothing compares to the real thing, but how intense did this, this, this training get this week? I'm not exactly positive what we saw today. It was very much nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts. Repetition, okay. repetition, building muscle memory. So when they are in that situation, if it is muscle memory, through yeah. that repetition, you can actually think about what you're dealing with and stack those priorities rather than thinking about the mechanics of what you're doing, clearing a room, things like that. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Andrew. We hope you're enjoying your day off, possibly for the federally recognized Juneteenth holiday or or maybe you're not, because you might live in a part of Idaho that doesn't really recognize it. This is the time we ask to hear your thoughts about the show, so please text us. A short and sweet, or maybe not so sweet, but at least clean, sure, okay? Send that message to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. And don't forget, include your name and the hashtag, the 208. June 19, 1865, the day Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, and officially liberated 250,000 or so enslaved black men and women and children in the Lone Star State. That day was two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, which ended slavery in the rebellious states in the middle of the Civil War. It's been said, well, it took that much time, two and a half years, for the emancipation news to reach those slaves and slave owners in Texas. But that's not exactly true. They all knew about the Emancipation Proclamation. There was just nobody there in Texas to enforce it until those Union troops showed up under the direction of Major General Gordon Granger, who, when he arrived, issued General Order Number 3. It read, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Order number three was just 93 words long. However, most of those words outside of that first sentence simply urged former slaves to stick around and work for their, quote, former masters. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They're informed they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. Remain quietly, work for wages, don't even think about getting any sort of assistance to get out on your own. Well, since then, June 19th or Juneteenth or Emancipation Day or Jubilee Day or Freedom Day or Black Independence Day, depending on your location, since then, Juneteenth has been celebrated as an important piece of black history, but usually just within the black culture. That is until President Joe Biden made it a national federal holiday on June 17th, 2021, by signing the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. In the Gem State, which actually became the fifth in the country to recognize the observant, uh, observance of Juneteenth back in 2001, well, that same day, June 17, 2021, Governor Little proclaimed it would be an Idaho holiday too. Juneteenth marks the celebration of not just a moment in the past, but also a renewed shared commitment to uniting as Americans and ensure equality and opportunity are reality for all Americans in the present and in the future. Although Juneteenth is still not codified in Idaho, by the way, 
it still only lists 10 holidays in the state of Idaho, other than Sundays recognized by the state, from New Year's Day to Columbus Day to Christmas. However, Governor Little used the next line of that law to make it happen in Idaho. Every day appointed by the President of the United States or by Governor of the state for a public fast, Thanksgiving, or holiday. Therefore, Juneteenth is now a state holiday. By the way, you know the last time Idaho's list of holidays was amended? That was back in 2002 when they changed Decoration Day to Memorial Day. So, still waiting for Juneteenth to be added to the list in state law. But according to the Pew Research Center, at least 28 states will recognize Juneteenth as a public holiday this year, four more than last year. And that means you get a paid day off from work if you work for the state of Idaho. State employees aren't the only ones getting that paid holiday, though. You may have noticed several city and county services and buildings were not open today, but not all. When this first became a thing back in 2021, it became newsworthy when one county decided it wouldn't recognize Juneteenth as any sort of thing. Idaho County, back in 2021, during their October 26th county commissioners meeting, well, Skip Brandt spoke up to say, according to the Idaho Association of Counties, Idaho County is not obligated to observe or recognize federal holidays. We did try to ask the Idaho Association of Counties about that today, but guess what? They're closed for the holiday. So the Idaho County didn't add Juneteenth to its schedule of paid holidays. And so the question is, why not? Well, when the Lewiston Tribune back in October of 2021 asked Commissioner Brandt this question, and whether the lack of recognition was politically or racially motivated, Brandt's response via email said this. In this woke movement, this woke movement world, I should say, I recognize that I am a white male. Thus, there is nothing I can do that not, will not be called a racist and a sexist, as far as that goes. We have enough recognized holidays. Americans need to get back to work, not find another excuse not to work. I'm not against anyone celebrating it. The real question, he said, is, as I suggested today, where are the holidays going to stop? Apparently the buck and the holidays stop in Idaho County and not just there either, because there are other counties who don't observe the holiday. We did take some time today to call around to several counties in Southern Idaho, not all of them, but a lot of them. And 14 of the 18 that we did call do recognize Juneteenth and give their employees a paid day off. The three that don't, that'd be Boise County, Camas and Minidoka counties. Jerome does, but they are still have, having, it, uh, I guess, apparently a commissioner's meeting tonight. Lincoln County has a question mark there because apparently the county named for the man who emancipated the slaves. Well, they didn't answer their phones today, so I guess they were off, maybe. So back to Idaho County. We did ask Commissioner Brandt if there was any plan to change how they recognize or observe Juneteenth. By email or by phone, we got this response by email. There have been discussions, or I should say there have been no discussions, he said on adding additional holidays, days of no work. We have plenty of holidays on the calendar, said Skip Brandt. Maybe you knew the idea of television was invented in Idaho. Well, at least you would if you watched our show last week. One of you, though, asked what else may have come from the Gem State. So we did a little digging and we found out. We want you to dig out your phones, send us your questions, your comments, even your concerns to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. And as always, include your name and the hashtag, the 208. And don't wait much longer because, well, the show's almost over. And if you want to see yours at the end of the show, well, you better be quick and clean and concise.
Well, the talk of the town today, or at least of many of my social media pages, mountain snow. Look at the Tamarack snow stake. This is a live look, and look what else is happening right now. We have more snow, or at least a kind of wet, wintry mix coming down on the snow stake at 6,600 feet right now. Of note, though, is that at one point, this snow stake, I got to squint to see it right here, was at seven inches earlier today. We've lost about three. It's down to four inches of snow now, but we might add back just a little bit. Temperatures hovering just above freezing there at Tamarack. The bogus snow stake, meanwhile, which sits at almost the same elevation, but of course, a lot further south, nada at Bogus. We saw maybe a quick burst of snow at the summit. That was about it for Bogus Basin. So Tamarack, the big winner, if you want to call it that. The other talk of the town here that everyone's uh, noticing is our cold temperatures. It looks likely that places like Boise, McCall, and Ontario may have the coolest June 19th on record as far as those high temperatures go. We've only hit 60 in Boise. Typically for this date, we're at 82 degrees. It's also been a very blustery day. Wind gusts approaching 40 miles per hour or greater across much of our region. We're cloudy over the mountains right now. We've also had thunderstorms firing off today because why not? We'll throw everything into the mix today. I'm not seeing any lightning now with this line of what appears to just be rain moving from west to east, but that's what's triggering those showers up at Tamarack and around Valley County here, Long Valley and McCall, stretching all the way down now to northern Ada County. So Boise, a couple of sprinkles possible out of this system as it moves through. Unsettled across the northwest and cold. We will be cold tonight. Fair warning. Morning. Frost is possible as we dip into the upper 30s and low 40s across the Treasure and Magic Valleys. Tomorrow, 66 degrees, still a chance of a shower or two, but Wednesday, our first day of summer, kicks off a nice warming trend. In fact, by Thursday, back to normal with highs into the 80s. All right, last week we told you about the history of television technology here at KTVB, part of our 70th anniversary celebration coming up. Piece of that was that Idaho was the birthplace of television. We included that in the story, that in 1927, Philo T. Farnsworth invented the idea of television in the small town of Rigby, Idaho. Now, after we aired that story, a few of you shared some interesting tidbits about, well, your connection to KTVB and Idaho and stuff. But one comment caught our eye when Jacqueline said, loving to hear that uh, TV was invented in Idaho, but what else has roots in Idaho? Well, there's a lot. But we looked into it, came up with a few that you may not have heard of. Maybe you did. Idaho is home to a lot of unique inventions. How about the French fry? Not the straight French fry, but the frozen one. J.R. Simplot, you probably heard his name a few times. He's the man we could thank for the first commercial frozen French fry. 1945, Simplot created a canning and dehydrating quick freeze plant where the perfect frozen French fry was, well, it was perfected. Simplot patented the product in 1953. How about other food items? You ever been to the West Side Drive-In in Boise? Famously featured on the Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, right? They're the creators of the ice cream potato. An ice cream sundae that, yes, looks like a baked potato. Doesn't taste like one, though. It's really good. Some will say it even pairs well with French fries. Of course you can. Staying in Boise, Boise State put their famous blue turf in place in 1986, the first non-green football field at a university, at any school. They had that title for 20 years until another university chose the color other than green. How about over in Blaine County, 1936, Sun Valley, opened with the very first chairlift. It completely revolutionized skiing. It was, they had the rope toe to begin with, but then put in this chairlift, changed everything. Ed Pulaski invented the Pulaski tool, which firefighters still use today. They use it to chop, grub, dig fire lines, brush filled, rocky terrain across the state of Idaho. That original prototype is in the Wallace District Mining Museum. That's in Wallace, center of the universe, by the way. That museum, though, is temporarily closed. All right, Boise, back to Boise. Capital of Boise, or capital of Idaho, that is, that is Boise. The first city to use geothermal heat for district heating starting in 1892. That's where the water that comes from deep underneath the surface is used to, you know, heat things. That's what we've been doing since then. Geothermal heat, Boise runs under the foothills and, of course, under Warm Springs, which is why that has the name of the Warm Springs neighborhood. Now you know. The Furby, by the way, also invented by a guy from Boise. Fry sauce, though, that was not. It was created in Utah. Gem State just kind of glommed onto it, take it as our own. If you know something we didn't mention, you can text us, 208-321-5614. Let us know. We'll look into it.
All right, speaking of the University of Idaho taking over the University of Phoenix, Bob wants to know this question. Why did Arkansas turn it down? Well, according to higher ed education, they said it was going to create a mess. Arkansas would be wise to avoid those that voted against it. And of course, their terrible reputation. That's just what they voted on the Board of Trustees for the University of Arkansas. Finger stakes. How could we forget? See you tomorrow.